He is risen. Good morning and a very warm welcome to this Easter Sunday reflection. And I'd like to wish you a very happy Easter wherever you are. May the, the love and the joy of our risen Lord Jesus just fill your hearts to overflowing. Our reflection theme this morning is a very appropriate one. It's peace be with you. Jesus, the risen Lord, is the one who brings peace into our troubled lives. I was chatting to somebody just a couple of days ago and they said that it just doesn't feel like Easter at the moment. It's all too gloomy and oppressive with these pandemic restrictions in place. You know, we can't have Easter egg hunts with the children. We can't invite lots of folks around to our houses for a big Easter celebratory lunch. Chapel will be different too. There won't be as many of us because there's still lots of us shielding. It can't be a full family service because we're not holding Sunday school at the moment. That's not possible. So it's, it's all a bit muted in some ways. Easter back in 2020 and now again in 2021 isn't quite the same. But here's a thought. Perhaps this changed circumstance is actually helpful in, certainly as regards to this reflection is concerned, in relating to those very first disciples in perhaps a way we've never been able to do before. You know, they are afraid of going out. They're locked in, stay at home disciples. It's not a virus they're afraid of, it's the lynchers. Their hearts are heavy because they've lost their friend more than that. They're fully aware that they didn't stand by their friend in his greatest hour of need. And I'm sure they're thinking to themselves, but life is never going to be the same again. Never going to get back to normal. We've had a lot of practice, haven't we, of relating to them in this last year. So we're going to join them in this first Easter Sunday. We're going to go through the pages of scripture. We're going to engage our mind's eye. We're going to witness again the scenes unfolding when those first disciples wake up, feeling so oppressed and locked in. And using our new perspective, if you like, our pandemic perspective, let's see what we can learn from them, because we've got so much extra empathy. So our text is John 20 verses 19 to 30. We often think of Easter as being a time of hope and it certainly is but the disciples had to wait a whole day before they actually were to witness that hope. So we're with them, they've gone through a whole day of hiding and cowering and now it's the evening. So going from verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, although the door was shut. Tom, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. 
do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in his book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Okay, let's try and engage our imaginations. We're going to enter this room where they are. It's going to be dark, probably airless. It'd be a real sense of tension in the atmosphere. I guess it was very claustrophobic. All these men packed in together in this dark room. We'll try and ignore the body odour because we won't let our imaginations run that far. This wasn't a nice place to be. Maybe they were hiding in shame as well. Like Adam and Eve hiding in the Garden of Eden. Hiding for shame away from God. And maybe they were doing the same because let's remember what happened before Jesus died. They'd made these big, bold promises that they would stand with Jesus no matter what. But where were they when he died? Well, they were here, hidden away, locked away, hiding in fear, hiding because the very people who were killing Jesus, brutalising him, might set their sights on these men too. So despite all their promises, they were just so much hot air. And they can't hide that truth from themselves. They're ashamed. In the text leading up to the one we read today, Mary had come to them first thing, and she told them that the body had been moved. They didn't know what to make of that, but it was certainly a, a distressing development. Then she'd come back later to say that she'd met Jesus. Jesus was risen. They kind of knew what to make of that. As far as they were concerned, she was being a bit delusional, fanciful thinking, off her rocker perhaps. But they certainly didn't listen. And then into this context of scepticism, disillusionment and fear, walks the risen Jesus. Imagine, imagine having all that guilt, that shame, that despair. If you've ever let somebody down badly, you know what it feels. Most of us have. You just want to turn the clocks back, make it okay, say something differently, behave differently. If only. Anything to ease that inner turmoil, to reconcile ourselves with the person we hurt. But generally speaking, that's impossible. We can't turn the clocks back, but what happens is a greater miracle still. Jesus walks in and what does Jesus say? Well, he doesn't say, where were you? Which would have been completely fair enough. Or you didn't stand by me, you let me down. No. The words of Jesus were this. Peace be with you. This was amazing, astonishing. Then John gives us what's probably the greatest understatement in the whole of Scripture. He writes, Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. I think we can shove a few exclamation marks on top of that sentence. They would have been beside themselves. On the one hand, I think that of course there was absolute delight that they've got their friend back. That Jesus hadn't failed after all. But I think there's more than that. Some of it comes from that opening words, those words of peace be with you. Because I think that communicated to the disciples Jesus' forgiveness. He was almost saying to them, you thought that I wasn't your friend anymore. I've come to restore that friendship. Peace be with you. Jesus then says, peace be with you again. He really reaffirms it. 
But after that, he does something extraordinary. He breathes on them. We're not talking like the coffee breath of a co-worker as they lean over your desk. We're talking the breath of God here. How does God bring life to Adam when he formed him from the clay? Well, according to Genesis, he breathed on him. Only the creator God can bring life from something that has no life. And in a sense, the disciples were kind of dead and lifeless spiritually. Jesus restores them with the breath of God. Because they're dead in their denial of Jesus, in their imperfections, in their guilt, in their lost hope. Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, unfortunately in English, it's hard to make the connection. But in Greek and in Hebrew, the word for breath is also exactly the same as the word for Holy Spirit. It's literally ruach. It sounds like a breath when you say it. Ruach, receive the breath, the Spirit of God. So Jesus, the one until, who until recently was dead, brings life. It's not just his own life as he's raised up. He brings life for others. He breathes life into the disciples, the Holy Spirit. As Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So Jesus knows exactly what we need. We need his life. And he also knew that the disciples needed to see, to hear and to touch. So in that first appearance, Jesus went in and he showed them his wounds. He showed them a hole in his side. He was doing it to prove to them that he wasn't some ghost, that he was actually the risen Jesus, the one who'd received the treatment on the cross. Thomas, poor old Thomas, he wasn't there the first time. So he didn't get to see that display of assurance. And ever since then, he's been given this title, or certainly in a few centuries after Jesus' death, he's become famous as the Doubting Thomas, which is really very sad because... I don't think any of us would have been very different in his place, or I certainly wouldn't. Anyway, he hears about these events from the disciples that were there. They tell him about Jesus coming and he treats them with exactly the same level of scepticism and disbelief as they showed Mary when she came to them. He couldn't believe it. It must be some mass hallucination or something, wishful thinking. Perhaps they'd seen some bloke who looks a lot like Jesus can't be Jesus, surely. You know, he was brutalised, he was broken, he was killed publicly. Don't we all wrestle with similar doubts? Don't we all struggle sometimes to get our head around things when we haven't seen them with our own eyes? So Jesus appears again. He repeats his earlier statement. Maybe it's for the benefit of Thomas. He says, peace be with you. Maybe he says it for a second time again to reassure the other disciples as if to say, Do you know, I really did mean it when I said that I'm your friend. Believe it. And then he homes straight in on Thomas. He knows what Thomas needs. He invites him to check out his wounds, to touch his side. We don't know if Thomas took up his invitation. I suspect possibly not. But we do know that Thomas responded very powerfully to this meeting with Jesus. He fell to his knees and we get the very first profession of faith in Jesus as God, in his divinity. He says, my Lord, my God. And he worships him. Jesus knows what we need. We need something tangible. I know I've asked him in my life at various points and I've had some incredible results. When you doubt, do you ask him? How easy or hard was it to put yourself into that text? 
Did you find you were looking at it like some clinical observer, someone dispassionate, maybe being a bit nosy? Or could you read it with empathy, relating to the characters, relating to their doubt, to their distress, their fear, their shame? I think the Bible is most effective when we can relate to the characters in there. Now this Easter is different to some what we've had. We're all a bit tired and jaded, we're locked down. We all feel a bit fed up. Maybe some of us are still a bit fearful at the danger that lies outside. Perhaps all of this helps us to relate better this Easter than in many of the Easter's gone by. We know what it's like to be in that stay at home fearful situation. But I don't think it's just lockdown and the pandemic that gives us heavy hearts, that steals our peace. There were plenty of situations that stole our peace long before COVID-19 turned up. Regrets, guilt, shame, grief, and we could write a very long list indeed. Now put yourself back in that closed room, if you will, in your mind's eye. Again, ignore the body odour, if you will, I would. Now this time, imagine Jesus is talking to Thomas. And then he's looking over Thomas's shoulder and he's looking straight into your eyes. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I believe we can all experience Jesus in some ways that are miraculous, but none of us spent three years with Jesus. None of us got to know him like Thomas or saw him physically face to face like that so we could touch him. But Jesus is looking beyond Thomas to us and he's saying, blessed are you. So Jesus at that point is stepping out of the story that we've been reading and stepping into our own lives, our own story. His story is our story, our story is his. And he comes to us in our lifeless, shame-filled, pain-filled situations and says, peace be with you. Effectively, I am your friend. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. You are blessed because you believe in me. I'm going to ask you a few questions now to close. Think of this as a bit of a reflection prayer time to end this Easter talk on. I'm going to ask a question, give you a few silent seconds to think it over but I'm going to give you a response from our text. So if you'll close your eyes with me now, let's do that. Do you feel afraid? Jesus says, peace be with you. Do you feel you've let God down? Jesus says, peace be with you. Have you been shutting God out of your life? Jesus says, peace be with you. Do you feel empty and inadequate? Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. Do you want to know that Jesus is real? Jesus says, reach out and touch me. Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God? Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Amen. God bless and thank you for sharing these few minutes on an Easter morning. I'll be seeing some of you later, but for those of you that I won't, a very special happy Easter greeting to you. And may God bless you and your families. Amen.